Bodies. Versus black holes. Okay? Whereas we have a complete theory of black body radiation, we don't have any thermodynamics of black holes. Whatever thermodynamics is, is in effect. This is what I want to show you. So, uh, we begin by defining a thermal wavelength. which is the ratio of the product of Planck's constant times C divided by the thermal energy. Okay? This is an upper relativistic wavelength. And where does it come from? It comes from black body radiation. Okay? Black bodies absorb and radiate all types of radiation. A uh, iron is known radiates in the infrared. When it's cooled down uh, to room temperature, you can see these little specks here, and they absorb. So when they radiate at te high temperature, they absorb at low temperature, and stars do much of the same thing. In the sun, you have protons, electrons colliding. And then uh, what happens is, is that, that electrons are slowed down, deaccelerated, emit photons. So this is called in uh, Bremsstrahlung. Strahlung means radiation, Brem means breaking. So things slow down. Uh, electrons slow down, they produce photons. Photons are again absorbed by electrons and they speed up. So this goes back and forth, establishing a uh, equilibrium radiation. And the fact is, is that it takes about 10 to the 6th year for these photons to get out of the sun. And this is very important about black body radiation. You have to have all the radiation in the box so it establishes equilibrium. So uh, a black body cavity, in German a horror, is a box which is heated to a temperature T but at the walls. And this sets into motion photons there's a black particle inside, which absorbs and emits them. So at a certain temperature, the system will um, have black body spectrum. How do we know this? Well, if you make a small hole in the box, very small, because you don't want energy to be emitted, very much energy, you have a, a, a heat-sensitive thermal couple and a prism, and you can break up the radiation into frequencies. <coughs> and from this, you obtain the black body spectrum. Which looks something like this. Okay? For every temperature, you get a curve. Okay? The higher the temperature, the curve moves into the ultraviolet region. This is the infrared region. So this is another prime curve. And what people notice, especially Dean, who noticed that at this maximum frequency, you get mu max divided by t is equal to a constant. Or lambda t equals a constant. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that is precisely this relationship. This is experimental. Okay? This is the first part that we did. The second part we did was try to reconstruct the curve. And we did so in analogy with um, Maxwell's speed distribution. Okay? So, rho, which is the density, the spectral density, is equal to the number of oscillators between a frequency nu and nu pu d nu times the energy e average at frequency nu. Okay? This quantity 
is nothing but the volume of phase, phase space occupied by the system. <coughs> the phase space is the product of the configuration volume, the volume of the whole, times the P Q divided by P R Q. This is the smallest area imaginable. These are prime cubes. And this is just a ratio of the two. So if I want the frequencies from new Pugini, I have to do this. Oh, this is four thirds. So this goes to uh, four pi v rho square p p p over h bar cubed. Okay. Now p is momentum. Okay. Momentum we know is equal to h nu divided by c. Okay. So if I just take this off, I'm working down to pi, take this off, and we get 4 pi times the edges cancel, mu squared in the mu, divided by c cubed. These are the number of oscillators in the frequency range d nu, but I have to multiply this by 2. Why 2? This was not known at the time, but this is the polarization of light. Okay? So you have two extra uh, degrees of liberty. This is 8 pi times this. Now, this is the number of oscillators in the frequency range. So if I put in rho in d nu, I have 8 pi nu squared in d nu divided by c cubed times the average. Okay? What is E averaged? Well, Wien told us that two. Wien told us that this is equal to <coughs> alpha prime nu e to the minus gamma nu divided by t. Why this form? Precisely because every time you see temperature, it's in the ratio of the ratio of nu times divided by temperature. And it also is an analogy with Maxwell. Okay? So this is what uh, we get for this. And this explains pretty much this area, this section of the curve here. This rises as nu squared and decays. But if we do something like Rowley genes, and we say that each oscillator has kT energy you get that, which was called by Ehrenfest the ultraviolet catastrophe. And all, most all books of uh, uh, physics explain the fact that Planck had the intention of trying to bring down the curve, that quantization brought down the curve to the Observe of, the, uh, of the observed spectrum. This is not true. Planck didn't know about equipartition of energy. He didn't care about it. He didn't know about it. And he was more interested, or completely interested, in a thermodynamic interpretation. So what he did was to take the logarithm of this minus Set this equal to the derivative of the entropy respect to the average energy of the oscillator and integrate to find the entropy. Okay? So he found, apart from constants, E minus E bar S. This entropy is absolute. S goes to zero as t goes to zero. There's no additive constant in this. Mm -hmm. Also notice that if I have n factorial, <coughs> I'll take the logarithm of that, and that in Stern's approximation is n log n minus n. 
So S has a form similar to the logarithm of n factorial. Not only that, you can show that this correspond uh, the entropy determines the distribution, <coughs> and the distribution is Poisson. Okay? Now, the interesting thing to notice is that Planck, what Planck did was to look at the entropy increasing. So he went to the second derivative here, and uh, he took the second derivative was minus 1 over Okay? And because entropy has to be com a concave function, this has to be less than or equal to zero. Okay? So we have entropy versus oscillator energy, and it goes something like this. And the uh, tangent is just 1 over t. Okay? Now, what people do with black holes is there is not much uh, to characterize a black hole, which is not charged or anything else. Don't worry about that. It's that it's radius. It's Schwarzschild radius. So Schwarzschild radius is when mc squared is equal at the same order as g, Newton's constant, central mass, divided by r. I can simplify that and write r is equal to g m over c squared. Okay? And if you believe in general relativity, it puts in a 2 here. So if I replace that, put that in there, and come out, I can come out with, uh, associate lambda with r, I get 2 g m divided by c squared is equal to h over k t. Okay? I can put this as a cube, bring this down. Okay? And now, if I multiply both sides, the numerator and denominator, by c squared, I come up with something like that. And this is the Planck energy squared over E is equal to K one over T. This energy is very large. It's about 1.22 times 10 to the 19 giga electron volts. So the thing is, is that uh, according to the uh, black hole experts, we are at a, a point where gravity becomes a force to reckon with. Okay? Now, the thing is, is that there are, uh, when Planck developed his theory, he had two parameters which were free. Gamma was a fitting parameter, and using the spectrum, he could fit this. And gamma turned out to be h over k. Planck's constant divided by Boltzmann's constant. Actually, both constants should be named after Planck, but that would be confusing. So he settled for his constant. So now we have c, h, e, charge, and g, and k, okay? These constants are more fundamental than e and g. e and g determine the interaction, okay? Planck said that h and c should be all equal for all universes at all times. c separates classical mechanics from relativistic mechanics. 
when you see C, it's you see you know it's relativistic. H separates our world from the quantized world. Okay. K separates macroscopic thermodynamics from micro microscopic thermodynamics. K is R divided by N, the universal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. So we are on a micro microscopic scale here. So all these three constants separate domains. G doesn't. Okay? So without G, uh, I can use E, C, H. These do not define any length. That is, I can make these energies, uh, energies, uh, characteristic times, but length, I must have. M is the mass. This is the Compton wavelength. So if I know the mass, I can define the wavelength, and vice versa. Okay. Now, E, H, and C do not combine to give anything. Wait, no, no mass. Why? Because electromagnetic waves propagate at the speed of light. They're massless. As soon as I put G in, I can determine what they call a Planck mass. So that's why I said that once I, I Planck length, but the mass there, the Planck, is not universal. It depends upon the strength of G, whereas E is independent. Now, uh, people, uh, electromagnetic waves propagate the speed of light, but according to general relativity, such as uh, uh, gravitational waves. But if gravitational waves <coughs> um, are limited, why? Because the mass limits their range of activity. It seems strange that they propagate at the speed of light. So here we have a combination of uh, Planck energy, which includes G. Okay? Now, having said that, I can again apply the second law and come out with S is equal to K E squared on E Planck squared plus the constant. Okay? This is the so called Dekenstein entropy. This is the, what they call the Hawking temperature. And together, they produce a body of incorrect information. Why? Because S is not no longer a convex function. A concave function, sorry. It's convex. Meaning that instead of a behavior like this, we get a, a parabola. Okay? And that causes problems. <coughs> um, I wanted to say something else. Okay, so if we again go back to uh, Planck, we can take the second derivative of this, d to s, is equal to. And this is the derivative of 1 over t, so it's minus 1 over t squared d in d of t. Okay? So from this, we can see that it is a convex function because this is greater than 0. In order to be greater than 0, dt and d, or the e and dt, which is the heat capacity, must be negative. And people say, well, stars have negative heat capacities. Okay? This does not follow from thermodynamics. This follows from what they call polytropes. Polytropes are, uh, have um, equations of state, 
such as p v to the n is a constant. Okay? And they only deal uh, the, the heat capacity which can be negative is defined as dq over dt. This is the quantity of heat added by the increment of temperature is equal to C. That is the heat capacity which can become negative. C is equal to zero, adiabatic. <coughs> C is equal to infinity, isothermal. And you can show that from the uh, doctrine of latent and uh, latent heats that this can under certain circumstances become negative. But this has nothing to do with the second law. Has nothing to do with absolute temperatures either. It should be an empirical temperature actually. Okay? So the thing at this point is, is this a feasible entropy to be to do business with? Okay? Now we know that these conservation of energy and that there is uh, the entropy should increase as we go from a more constrained state of equilibrium to a less constrained state. That means we put up barriers in our system and then remove these barriers and wait an infinite amount of time and compare the final state with the initial state. And we should see that the entropy should increase if the temperatures of the bodies were initially different. Okay. So let us I'll try to apply this to this system. Um, <coughs> DQ is equal to DQ in DV and T constant in DV plus dq in dt in dt. This is called the doctrine of latent and specific heats by choose L. This is L V plus in this case C V M. This is the specific heat. This is dv. This was used even before the advent of modern thermodynamics, it was used by the uh, people who believed in the conservation of caloric heat as a material substance. This is the heat which is insensitive is to touch. This is the heat sensible to touch. So this, if you go through a phase transition, latent heat from liquid to uh, vapor, okay? Now, why black holes cannot evaporate using um, black body radiation is because it consists of a phase equilibrium. There are many different ways of deriving it, but Raleigh, Mark Raleigh, back in 1902, was studying the pressure of, vibra uh, the pressure of vibrations and used the gibbs air relation to derive uh, first the Klaproon equation, okay? And then to show that um, the energy varied as t to the fourth, which is Stefan's law. Okay? That's black body radiation. E total is equal to the density times V, which is equal to um, E is a function only of T, so you have a constant sigma T to the fourth V sigma. That's a radiation constant. Okay? So you can do this by introducing an equation of state. P is equal to one-third E. One-third was first used by Boltzmann back in 1884, saying that uh, the pressure should come 
which is distributed to <coughs> three sides of the box. Okay? But this he already knew the answer. He wanted t to the fourth, Stefan's law, and uh, which doesn't hold for a perfect guess. A perfect guess, you'd have two thirds. So it was an opportune uh, choice of Boltzmann to choose one third. And if you do one third, you get one third e minus one third. Um, t squared in dt equals zero. Okay? So, um, we have one third and one, which is four thirds. So we have dE over t is four thirds dt over t squared times e. Uh, t squared. We can eliminate one of the t's. There's a 3 here, which can also be eliminated. And this immediately gives t to the fourth. We can integrate. So what uh, Rayleigh did was to say, well, maybe I don't have three dimensions. He was working with strings, vibrating strings. So I'll make a general statement that this is 1 over eta. Leave it like that. And instead of finding e is equal to c t to the fourth, we found 1 plus eta. Where eta is equal to 3, you get Stefan's law. Now, Stefan found his law simply by heating iron from 525 degrees to 1,000 degrees. And he found the intensity of light increased by a factor of 12. And if you measure, if you uh, bring the ratio of the two temperatures to the fourth power, you come out with something like 11.6, which is pretty close to 12. Empirical law. That's not the hold for all black bodies. So here we have the energy increasing at a higher power than the temperature. Okay? The temperature, E is equal, uh, E is uh, proportional to T for an ideal gas. T, or KT, is the thermal energy which the molecules move around with. So what this is saying is that I have more energy available because photons are not conserved. They, uh, they are born and they die. There's no conservation of photons. So here I have other sources of energy creation, annihilation of photons, plus the motion and everything else. Okay? So it increases a higher power. But how do you get energy increasing at a smaller power than the first power in temperature? Doesn't make any sense. And that's exactly what this says. Inversely proportional. Okay? Now um, so, in this sense, what Raleigh did was to um, first expand this Divide through by dt, energy density plus pressure is enthalpy, and that is precisely the latent heat. Okay? T was not known uh, initially by Clapeyron. It's equilibrium. The pressure is independent of the volume. So the volume can be used to pass one mole of substance from one phase to the other so that the pressure, vapor pressure, remains constant. Okay? 
And this is the law. According to the Gibbs uh, phase rule, and R minus M uh, plus M minus M plus 2. F is the number of independent variables I have, in intensive variables. Uh, M are the phases, and R is the substance. So I have one substance, which is photons. I have two phases, the two phases being the gas inside the cavity, and the walls which surround it. The walls are like uh, reservoirs which can pass photons back and forth. So if I expand the walls slightly to maintain equilibrium, I have to inject more photons. If I contract the walls, the walls contract, I have to absorb photons. So this is like a, sublima a sublimation, heat of sublimation in this sense. And F, therefore, is equal to 1. I have P and I have mu. For a regular phase equilibrium, mu, the chemical potential, is a function of pressure and temperature. Okay? And if I have phase one, the equilibrium is between the two phases. This allows P to become a function only of temperature. Because photons are not conserved, the chemical potential of thermal radiation is zero. I have one independent variable. So there is no way that uh, black body radiation can be used to evaporate black holes. And they don't end in explosions with photons being ejected at X-ray energies. Okay? It's a delicate equilibrium which must be maintained. Okay? Now, there is uh, the laws of thermodynamics behave very much like the laws of mathematics, inequalities. Okay? And this is something like the chicken and the egg, which came first. So we all know that if I write a general mean of anything as sum of all systems times p, which is a set of probabilities, times x, which is what I'm observing, and I take this to 1 over p, this is what I define as a mean of order um, p. Okay? Uh, one moment. The p as I said, p, okay. So I know that m of p plus 1 is greater than m p, my, uh, p which is greater than m of p minus 1. Okay? And this goes from P to plus infinity to P equals minus infinity. Okay? As an example, I can choose P equals to zero. If P is equal to zero, this becomes the weighted arithmetic mean, this becomes the geometric mean, and this becomes the harmonic mean, g, what is zero? It goes in that sense, okay? Now, uh, if I take this black hole, or any object, actually, first, just compose the cell, different, I can, Split it up into different cells. And at first, I impose that the walls separating the two are adiabatic. That means I can't pass heat from one to the other. And all these cells are different temperatures T1, T2, T3, etc. 
And this was done back in 1852 by Thompson, Kelvin. And he asked, if I remove the walls and replace them by diathermal walls, what is the final common temperature they all arrive at? Well, if I take this out, wait a long enough time, and do nothing on these cells, these cells have to have any engines, kind of engines, nothing, the final temperature Well, it will be, if they are all equal weights, 1 over n, I have n cells, times t. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but, if I have little ideal uh, Carnot engines inside, then the final temperature will be Geometric temperature, okay? Geometric mean temperature. So since this temperature is lower than this temperature, it can work. This is Cardinal's principle. In order to produce work, I have to have a difference in temperature. The lower the temperature, the more the work. So somebody can turn around and say, well, why stop here? I can use these negative orders and get even more work. Okay? Now, if you write the harmonic mean, which is that, inverse temperature, if one of these cells has zero temperature, this explodes. It becomes infinite. Okay? And it violates the third law. So people can say, well, the heat capacities I can use anywhere I want. I can exclude low temperatures and we'll just work at high temperatures and this becomes okay. No, it's not okay. I want to show you. Thermodynamics is self-consistent and it's non-lenient. It's very strict in its laws. So, now, if we go back to the Bekenstein thing here and uh, solve this, I have a heat, um, since I don't know what a volume is, I can consider this simply that. And since I'm doing no work, because there is no mechanical variable here, like there is for black body radiation, black body radiation is E <coughs> sigma to the power to one quarter uh, V to the three quarters. Okay? Uh, this has to be less than 1, otherwise it's no longer concave. Okay? So, the thing is, is that in this case, I have a mechanical variable. I can do compressional work on the cavity, and everything is fine. Here I don't. So let's just work with this. Since no work is being done, this I can write as C, M power, specific heat. And I can consider all the specific heats, which is a function of temperature, uh, all the specific heats is common, a same substance. And in this sense, what I obtain here, I obtain another constant, you know, like squared. Because it's d squared p in the denominator, okay? That is, I just call it this other constant C here. And I want to integrate this from the initial temperatures to the final temperature. And this I can consider the first law. Change in energy. There's no work being done. And if I do that, I come out with C is a constant. There's a sum here over all cells, I. So, the first one is the sum of M, I, T, 
final. Okay. This negative sign here, sorry, because it's negative. I think the final temperature here. And here I have uh, the sum of M pi. This is equal to zero. Bekenstein predicts that the final temperature will be the harmonic mean temperature. Okay? The sum of Ni, I call M, and T1 over T, C is equal to, uh, no, C, sorry, C. This is equal to 1 over N. So, if I impose the third law here, the limit as t goes to zero, s must go to zero, I got problems. So I can't use the third law. Okay? Now, if I divide dq by the integrating factor, t, I get entropy. So the change in entropy is equal to C sum m i integral from t by t f d t i over t cubed negative one power more in the denominator and this comes out with C m t final squared Minus sum n i t i squared. Okay? N was the sum. Now, if you go back here, and I can call this whole thing here e final. C M over T final. And these are the initial energies. So all this says is that the final energy is the sum of all the initial energies. Conservation. I expect it. Nothing, nothing, you lose, you don't lose any energy in this case. So fine. That's what that says. What does this say? Well, first, let's make things simple. Suppose I only have two cells. So I can write this as C M T F squared minus um, M1 C over T1 minus C M2 over T2 squared. And this must be greater or equal to zero. Entropy cannot. Uh, can stay the same, but not decrease. Okay? So now, I can multiply all this by squares. Okay? And I can write this as E final squared divided by M. Because I, have, I need another M up on top, so I need one down below. And this too, minus E one squared divided by n1 minus e2 squared divided by n2 and this must be greater or equal to zero okay another simplification let me call m1 and m2 equal put them equal and therefore m is equal to 2m so this I have a 2 here. Okay? Now what is E final? E final is just the sum of the energies. So this says that E1 plus E2 squared must be greater or equal to E2 E1 squared.
squared plus 282 squared. A little algebra shows that 2e1, e2, must be greater or equal to e1 squared plus e2 squared, which is obviously wrong. This is a perfect square, and this has to be greater than 0. Hmm? What went wrong? Thermodynamics is consistent. It says, this is okay. That, uh, I can have, this is a, a mean of order 2, minus 2, which is a greater, uh, this is a mean of order 1, which is a minus 1, which is greater than a mean of minus 2, because this is squared. Okay? So this is okay, according to this mathematical rule here, that the means of order p is a monotonic increasing function of p. But, once I put in energy, according to this relationship, things don't work. Because E is not in proportion to T. It's inversely proport inverse proportional to. So I come up with a contradiction. It doesn't work. Okay? The final thing I want to say is that uh, string theories, uh, uh, theories, I've got a whole of uh, this uh, thermodynamics, and claim that any theory of quantum gravity must obey these laws. Okay? And uh, even that string theory is able to derive, as an extreme, it's extreme case, the entropy, the Beck Newsom entropy uh, uh, expression. Well, if a theory can derive a wrong result, the theory itself must be wrong. And to show you this, how can you consider uh, two at the same time, uh, two uh, expressions? One for black body, in which S is varies like this, and one that varies like this. How can they make it, be made compatible, they ask. Well, they can't, but they try. And how do they try? By defining a Hawking temperature. This is the Hawking temperature. Can you see it? It's, uh... Okay? Now, they, they take off the Hawking temperature by writing down what they call an anti decider universe. We won't talk about anti-decidal universes today, but I'll just show you that uh, you could write down a metric. Ds squared is equal to some f of r dt squared minus f to the minus 1 r dx squared, etc. Okay? Where f is a nonlinear function of r. Okay? And they evaluate this at the Schwarzschild radius, and they come out with an expression for Hawking, which is r squared plus 2r plus, they call, 2 pi r squared r plus. r plus is something similar to the Schwarzschild radius, which they plot. r is the radius of curvature. So, they work in two domains, one in which r plus is uh, very small compared to r, in which case they get t Hawking is equal to 1 over r plus, okay? which is what uh, r is proportional to the mass. Okay? So they come out with uh, a proportion of the energy, so they come out with this inverse relationship here. But then they have another region in which r is much greater than the uh, radius of curvature, and they come out with Ds. r plus. They need this one. Okay? Because now, T is increasing with r, not decreasing with it. That's what the two uh, 
the two uh, parts of the trajectory curve mean. Now the question is, in the same system, without touching anything, how can you go from one expression of t to another expression? And how can you have two black holes for the same value of t? Something is clearly wrong here. Very wrong. If I leave a system to itself, adiabatically, the temperature will go down. Okay? This says that uh, I have ds is equal to d divided by D, divided by T, okay? This is equal to what if it's adiabatic? I have DE, V, plus V, DE, plus one-third E, DV, okay? Um, no, sorry. Uh, no, again, E dV. Okay? One plus a third is four thirds. So that's four thirds E dV plus D E V equals zero. So I have E, for integrating this, I have E times V to the four thirds. Adiabatic condition. If I introduce black body, this is t to the fourth, and I can simplify that by saying t v to the one third is a constant. V is proportional to the radius cubed, so this is proportional to the radius. And this says that as the universe expands, the temperature will go down. If it's adiabatic, there's no exchange of uh, heat with whatever is outside the universe. This one, uh, so this is the relationship. It doesn't say anything like this or like this. Okay? Now with that, but then the thing is that if R is proportional to T, then they need, and the entropy is proportional to area, as they call it, the area is proportional to R squared. So they say, we don't want uh, four dimensions, three plus time, we want five dimensions. So the area goes as cubed in this dimension, okay? Now if I put in T here, this is proportional to T cubed, which is entropy of black body radiation, because E is to the fourth, E divided by T is S, which is a third, which is uh, uh, four thirds of that, which is uh, t to the cubed. So here they reconcile the string theory thing working in uh, in five dimensions with black body radiation. The problem is going back to Rayleigh's uh, derivation of the uh, Clapeyron equation and his solution. He found that E is equal to some T, the e energy density, sorry, as 1 plus N. If N is associated with dimensionality, mm -hmm. there is no reason why I should come out with regular black body radiation in three dimensions when I'm using five dimensions. The whole thing is confused. What? The equipartition uh, theory. Uh, says that uh, you you divide the, the total amount of energy into three parts because you have to you have three freedom grade. It's a freedom. Yes, I mean be, because there are three dimensions, mm -hmm. and so you have three freedom. Uh, three degrees of freedom. Yes, but if if you have five uh, freedom uh, grades of uh, freedom. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you have five dimensions because, for example, a spring has more grids of freedom than a, 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 a single body. 
The thing is, is that these degrees of freedom are unobservable. Yes, the, the degrees of freedom are, are unobservable, but the, the degrees of... Now, one of the tests I propose for spin theory is that if they <laughs> see these ions, protons colliding in high energies, and if the energy or momentum is not conserved, which we know it is, then energy can seep in to these other degrees of freedom. That would be indication that these degrees of freedom exist. But this is completely wrong. Because as far as we know, there is nothing, uh, uh, no experiment has been shown to disprove uh, uh, the conservation of energy or momentum. There is these degrees of freedom, if they exist, and they don't exist, uh, we clearly mean a violation of all the conservation laws we know. So it's not actually dividing up into degrees of freedom of rotation, translation, and vibration. Because these degrees of freedom are not observable. So they're there, but they're not there. Which makes no sense. Well, they are observable indirectly by using, uh, for example, the amount of energy absorbed to express them. In, you're talking about the, uh, the, the string theories? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about the simple molecules, for example. Ah, no, right. Those, I have no. I'm using here. Yes, I understand that. But uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it, it's not it's not wrong at, at all uh, because it, it, you can uh, you can divide. Uh, uh, but you're it. saying that these degrees of freedom have been activated thermally. Yes. Exactly. Okay, but the thing is, is that we know that these degrees of freedom exist if we go to high enough temperatures. Yes. Okay. How high do you have to go? to activate these degrees of freedom. So the question is, is that uh, to see, plus the fact is that for a black hole, it's black. You don't know what's inside. Mm -hmm. Okay? And associating information with area is completely incorrect. Because information, entropy as information, means that the basic thing is log of pi. Okay? That is the uh, log of pi is um, the probability. Pi is a set of probabilities, okay? And if I average this pi, sum over all the whole set, I come out with what is called Shannon Gibbs entropy, okay? This is a function of probabilities. This is not a function of probabilities. So information here saying that I have one bit of information per area, elementary area, who knows what it means? <coughs> Entropy as a function of probabilities is a completely different thing, okay? I have probabilities, and I don't have this set of extensive variables, okay? So, these are two different animals. We should not be confused. Unless I know I can express the probabilities as a function of extensive variables, I don't have anything. Okay? So the same area and entropy are this, plus the fact is that if this is entropy, this entropy behaves much differently. This is a concave function. Okay? This is a convex function if this is S. So I wouldn't invest any time or uh, effort in showing that the area is a, uh, related to S. Actually, what we do know is that if you go back to this uh, volume of phase space, okay, in n dimensions, most of, the, uh, most of the volume resides at the surface because the, dif the difference between the surface area and the volume is little once the number of degrees of freedom go to infinity. But you need the log and not the surface area itself. Why is that? Because the entropy cannot increase any faster than uh, e to the um, some n less than 1. Okay? And as it tends to 1, you get the what they call the Hagedorn temperature, which is the temperature of the fireball, early universe. So the thing is, is that it must increase 
at a power less than E. You just can't have it ex exploding. Makes no sense. And that's what they have here. Makes no sense. Okay, I think that's fine.